Hi, I'm Lucy Laganienta, a research assistant for the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and today I'm here with Dr. Kenneth Hartvigson. Dr. Hartvigson holds a doctorate in art history from Boston University, and he was the previous curator of American art at the BYU Museum of Art. He currently teaches full-time as part of the art history faculty here at BYU. The piece we'll be talking about today here is A Bright Recollection by Paige Anderson. The work is acrylic and oil on panel, and we're pairing it today with Alma chapters 8 through 12. So as we look at this piece, um, I just want to start off with its style for a little bit. Amer er, abstract art can be a little bit uncomfortable when it's not something we're used to and familiar with, and a little bit intimidating sometimes. Um, so from previous conversations with you, I know that for you, art doesn't necessarily have to make logical sense. Right. So give us some background on how you see abstract art. Sure. Um, well, you know, first of all, I think that art, um, for me personally, uh, communicates with me very much in the same way that uh, the spirit communicates with me, with, which is to say that sometimes I have spiritual experiences, and I'd imagine a, a lot of people uh, have similar, have had similar experiences with their, in their lives, where you have spiritual experiences, where you feel something, uh, or come to know something that is 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 very important to you, very mm -hmm. significant to you, but that you might struggle to put into language that would be yeah. understandable by others. Um, the spirit tends to operate in a way that um, I wouldn't say is uh, is illogical or anti-logical, but seems to be sometimes outside of just the realm of our mm -hmm. logical experience of the world. Um, and art can be very similar to me, that I can um, interact with, with artworks and art objects and sometimes feel things or think things or, or come to understand things, that then it would be difficult to turn to someone and explain exactly yeah. how that process had taken place. Um, and you're right, particularly when we talk about abstract art, it can be um, intimidating or, or isolating for people mm -hmm. to look at an abstract work of art, um, especially if it's something that they don't spend a lot of time doing, if they don't have a lot of experience looking at abstract art. Um, if, if a work is, is uh, truly abstract, you know, something like this, where it, it lacks um, recognizable features or you know, figures, um, no conventional narrative, yeah. you can feel a little um, untethered. You know, you're kind of you're kind of set on your own, and um, you're, you're left without recognizable kind of uh, mileposts to to judge your experience by. Um, but for me personally, I actually think that's one of the things that makes abstract art very valuable, mm -hmm. which is to say that um, abstract art gives us a space and a time where we can actually just think and feel whatever it is that we think and feel. Um, standing in front of an abstract work of art, um, you don't have to understand a narrative. You don't necessarily have to think about meaning. Um, you certainly can engage with those things if you'd like to, but more than anything else, an abstract work of art just gives you a time and place and says, what are you feeling? Anything you want to feel is okay in this space. And so I find it very liberating personally. Fantastic, that's excellent background for this, thank you. How do you see this piece interpreting or engaging with the scriptures that we have in Alma chapters yeah. eight through twelve? Um, you know, looking at, at Alma eight through twelve, one of the um, one of the words that came to my mind is persistence. Mm -hmm. You know, when we see this story of Alma, um, you know, preaching the word and being rejected, yeah. and um, but then having this angel come back to him and say. You have to go back. You have to. You have to do it again. <laughs> uh -huh. um, you know, even though nobody listened to you, even though they uh, threatened you, even though they kicked you out, you need to go back. Mm -hmm. um, you you need to do this again. Um, and uh, that feeling of that of uh, that I think a lot of us would recognize in our lives of sometimes being asked to do things over and over that um, have seemed to be unsuccessful or have been difficult or have been challenging, and um, and sometimes it's easier for us to say to ourselves or say to the Lord, um, we already tried that and it didn't work. Are you sure I need to do that again, yeah. right? Like I'm, I'm ready for the next thing, right? I'm ready um, for that prayer to be answered or I'm ready for that way to be opened or for that relationship to be healed, mm -hmm. um, whatever the case may be. Uh, but there is a way that the Lord teaches us through asking us to try again um, and, and do the same process again, sometimes even when it's challenging. And, you know, I look at a piece like this where we see these small shapes that are repeated over and over, mm -hmm. and it is actually through their repetition that we can stand back and see 
a really wonderful and beautiful pattern and that that pattern takes a shape um, that is above and beyond what the individual mm -hmm. forms that are being repeated are. Sort of a greater whole. A greater yes. whole, exactly. And so we think about Alma and Amulek um, being asked to go back and, and, and preach to people who have already said no. <laughs> and, um, and I think we can, again, step back and say, well, there is a greater pattern at play here. Mm -hmm. There's a, a larger picture. Uh, there's a greater whole involved, but that that greater whole only takes place because there are people willing to do the work again and again with that persistence. Yeah. Um, and so that's something I really see. Another thing that I, th I think about with, with these chapters is um, the idea of, of uh, interactions between peoples. You know, we see mm -hmm. Alma at first on his own and then meeting Amulek, right? And wow. so we see the two of them learning to work together. Um, and uh, we see Amulek's conversion and commitment to the gospel. So we see the two of them kind of coming together and becoming a, a missionary companionship. And we see the interactions between them and the audiences that they're preaching to, um, both people in the audiences, in these audiences who continue to reject them. And then also a few people who are, are convinced or are touched by the words that they share. Um, and so it, it, it is very much a story of those interactions between individuals. And once again, I think that's something we see here, right? We see this, this interaction, this interplay between these little discrete pieces, these, uh, these individual shapes, which if you took them out, may seem identical in some ways or may seem very different in some ways, whether you're talking about their shape, they may seem identical or the colors, they may seem completely opposed to each other. But it is, once again, that idea of combining these things together, the interactions between these, these things, which uh, gives this piece its power and its shape. Um, and so I, I, I think, yeah, for me, this piece very much speaks about small things building together and the way that we can interact together to create something. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I love that idea of persistence, especially the artist talks about in her process of creation, how she'll paint and then she'll sand down a layer oh, and she'll yeah. paint. So yeah. that totally ties in with this repetitive process to create something Absolutely. bigger and greater. Absolutely. That's perfect. All right. Can you contextualize this piece within like the greater genre of LDS art for us? Yeah. You know, Latter-day Saint art has traditionally um, been a little wary of, of abstraction. Certainly. Um, I think it took, um, it's taken a long time for Latter-day Saint artists to embrace abstraction as a viable way of expressing faith. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even now, even though we do see some artists uh, doing this, it's, it's still not the norm. It's, it's yeah. still a little bit of an outlier. Um, we, we do certainly have other Latter-day Saint artists who are incorporating um, a freer use of color and a freer use of form in their paintings or in their sculptures or drawings, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but still, it's, it's, fu it's much more common in Latter-day Saint art to have a, a strong narrative base mm -hmm. and a strong narrative content that, that is still very much the norm, um, relying upon human figures and these kinds of things. And so this, this is, I think, um, a, an unusual example mm -hmm. of Latter-day Saint art, but I think it's a hopeful example. Um, works like this help me see that uh, we are experiencing a kind of Latter-day Saint renaissance mm -hmm. in the arts. I think this is a time of um, opening, uh, of an opening of style, an opening of, of opportunities, um, where, where members of the church are recognizing that faith can be expressed in lots of different ways. Yeah. Um, faith can be expressed through different, uh, different life experiences and cultural experiences, cultural backgrounds. Um, and, you know, the history of modern art which is something I teach um, at BYU. The history of modern art is, is oftentimes um, discussed as a kind of secularization or that there's a strong secularization mm -hmm. that takes place yeah. during the modernist movement in the 19th and 20th centuries, where a lot of people talk about um, artists challenging tradition and challenging faith and challenging organized religion. And that is certainly something that happens within the tradition of modern art. Um, but also within the kind of uh, the, the writing of modern art history, the historiography of modern art, recently uh, a lot of people are saying, well, um, faith didn't completely disappear. A lot of modern artists that we talk about um, never completely left their faith or perhaps left organized religion for a while, but then returned to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though traditionally things like abstraction um, and the experimentation that we see yeah. in form and color and these kinds of things has been paired with 
a more kind of a religious or secular environment. I think we're now starting to realize that that's a partial truth. And so I think there always was room in um, the world of abstract art, the world of modernism and postmodern art. I think there always was room for faith mm -hmm. in that conversation. Um, so I, I think there's an opportunity to see works like this, not only as broadening the Latter-day Saint art experience, mm -hmm. but also as reclaiming a position in the world of modern art and contemporary art mm -hmm. that says you can express personal faith. You don't have to leave those things behind to still be finding new ways of creating and expressing yourself artistically. I love that so much. That's great. Finally, can you share a personal reaction you have to this piece or to the scripture block we talked about? I, 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 really love, <laughs> I really love her work. From, uh -huh. from the first time I saw um, one of her pieces, it, one of the things that struck me um, was exactly what you mentioned before is the sanding. Mm -hmm. The fact that you know we have these beautiful colors, these layers of colors, but then she'll sand back to reveal, uh, to reveal these, these interweaving kind of layers and, mm -hmm. and nuances of color. Um, and um, for me, it very much feels like something that could be interpreted by somebody as an imperfection. You know, it's, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. scratching, right? Um, the sanding is literally scratching. It's, it's wearing away the surface. And, and sometimes we, um, we only want the world to see the surface, right? We only want people to see what's on the outside, what, we've, uh, what we consider kind of the finished surface of who we are. Um, and so by kind of scratching, she's revealing something um, that lies beneath that um, maybe feels like sometimes the things we want to hide or the things we feel like we've outgrown mm -hmm. or that are no longer part of us. But that's the beauty of these pieces is that by sanding, by scratching, by revealing these, uh, these layers of color, this nuance of color, it makes it a far richer composition. Yeah. The colors are more complex. They're no, more dynamic. Um, and it, it creates actually a kind of, uh, we keep talking about like a whole, right? Mm -hmm. It creates a kind of holistic feeling because you'll see these scratches almost as a unifying thing between the different shapes. Um, and, uh, and I find that to be such a beautiful commentary on who we are. The fact that what we tend to view as our imperfections might actually be the things that are making us richer people mm -hmm. and are providing the nuance through which we learn and grow and that sometimes we can't see that um, what we view as our imperfections are actually things that make us really glorious and beautiful. And, um, and you know, one of the things it talks about in the scripture, even, you know, the title of this piece is, you know, the bright recollection, right? Yeah. Well, in the context of the verse um, in the Book of Mormon, it's a bright recollection of our weaknesses, a bright mm -hmm. recollection of our guilt. And, um, <clears throat> but that phrase is so interesting, a bright recollection, which sounds so positive, yeah. and then of our guilt, <laughs> which sounds <laughs> pretty heavy, right? Um, but so I think that kind of balancing of, of the light and shadow, the bright um, and, and the dark, the, um, the things that we think are, are unfinished or imperfect, um, and the overall pattern that is actually the the larger perfection, the larger beauty that we should be moving toward. Um, I feel like all of those things are, are presented by this painting. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And thanks for joining us on this episode of Behold.